Hello again, everyone. Mike Goucher of Marquette University Law School with you, along with Professor Charles Franklin, the director of the Marquette University Law School poll. We are doing a special presentation because this is the uh, kickoff to the Democratic National Convention here in Milwaukee. We use that uh, somewhat loosely because, as we all know, the Milwaukee Convention has been scaled back greatly, but it has not diminished the importance of the state of Wisconsin in this year's presidential campaign. And so what we're going to do over the next half hour or so is walk through the results of the Marquette Law School poll this year and in years past to get a good sense of the state of the state of Wisconsin. And Charles, let's begin by talking about how important Wisconsin was back in 2016 and how important it may be in 2020. Yeah, uh, you know, in 2016, we had a race that was decided in the Electoral College by the three states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. With those three states, Donald Trump took an Electoral College majority, but he won the three states by a total of just 77,000 votes, just 23,000 here in, in Wisconsin. Uh, so if no other states moved, for the Democrats to retake the presidency in the Electoral College, they would have to win all three of these Midwestern states. Three of the last five presidential races in Wisconsin have been decided by just a single percentage point. So we're in a close group, uh, a group that was pivotal last time and a historically very competitive state, despite two pretty substantial wins by Barack Obama. One thing you hear today, Charles, is, is at least some discussion about whether Wisconsin is truly as important as it was in 2016 because of the emergence of other battleground states, whether it's North Carolina or, or Florida or Arizona for that matter. What about that? That's an important point. The battleground seems to have expanded a bit in all three of the states you mentioned, Arizona, Florida, and North, uh, North Carolina. Polling is showing either a tight race or Biden leading by a little bit. All three of those states were also won by Donald Trump in 2016. So flipping any would be crucial. And Florida, because it's such a large state, could play a big role. Should it flip, then the Electoral College could be decided by one of the remaining five states. So in that sense, Wisconsin is not in that same tiny group of pivotal states. The battleground has expanded a bit, but everyone has us in the battleground in those six states. Uh, Charles, let's recap the polling that we've done here at uh, Marquette University Law School. And, and we'll begin by how uh, President Trump and uh, former Vice President Biden have been faring in our matchups when we put them together and see how people feel about the, the election. In our recent polling since May, after the Wisconsin primary, which was held in April, among likely voters, we've seen Biden with leads of 4%, 6%, and just this past week, 5% in our latest Marquette Law School poll. Uh, if we look back earlier uh, since a year ago, we've seen that Biden has led most of the polls since last August. Trump led one, and they were tied in February. Uh, so it's been a state that's tilted a bit towards Biden. The average over all of those polls is a Biden lead between three and four points. Give me a sense of how voters in the state of Wisconsin have felt about the presidency of Donald Trump. Voters are more negative than positive about Trump here in the state. His job approval rating has been lower approval than disapproval. Uh, throughout his term in office, though we have seen a couple of polls where approval and disapproval were tied, uh, most recently at 48% each in the last several months. Uh, so there has been uh, a little bit of negativity. On the other hand, he does do a little less badly in Wisconsin than he does nationally. Typically, our Wisconsin polls show his approval anywhere from two to four percent above the average of the national polls, as in you would expect to be in keeping with a state that he won uh, four years ago. Um, the other thing is that Trump's appeal within the party has shifted a bit. In 2016, um, he was viewed quite unfavorably and 
lost the Republican primary here in Wisconsin. But we saw that begin to shift during the campaign four years ago. After the convention, Republican partisans start to be- started to become notably more favorable towards him. And very late in the campaign, independents who lean Republican became more favorable. After he was elected, independence became more favorable. Democrats really haven't budged. They give him no more than a 10% favorability rating, and that really hasn't changed since his election. But he does have a more secure hold on the Republican Party now than he did through much of the 2016 race. He is uh, facing a number of uh, big issues right now. Uh, you have the, the, the economy. Uh, you have, of course, the pandemic and uh, how he's handled that and, and also the, the issue of uh, how he's handled the mass protests that followed the uh, police killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Let's walk through that, uh, Charles. What, where does uh, the president fare best and where is he most in trouble on these issues? Certainly over this spring and summer, these three constitute the great crises facing the country. Uh, Something else may come along in the fall, but at the moment, these really stand out. Trump's strong suit has been and remains in Wisconsin, evaluations of his handling of the economy. Uh, We've seen that as high as 56 percent this year, but it has fallen off a bit in recent months. Uh, to 50% in June and 51% approval in our latest August poll. Voters are pretty negative in their evaluations of the economy and how it stands today versus a year ago, but they remain relatively optimistic about where it will be a year from now. And maybe that is one of the things, that optimism, that helps sustain Trump even in the face of the current economic downturn brought on by the coronavirus. Speaking of the coronavirus, uh, there we've seen some movement in Trump's approval. In March, at the beginning of the shutdowns, 51% in Wisconsin approved of the job he was doing handling the virus. In May, that fell to 44%, where it remained into June, but it has dipped to 40% in August. So that 11-point swing is larger than the swing we've seen in his overall job approval, really, at any time in his presidency. Uh, And it's a fairly rapid change. It also mirrors the national pattern we've seen, where national polling shows his approval on coronavirus was at a peak in late March and fell steadily into, into July, at least. Uh, Finally, on the Black Lives Matter protests, he gets especially poor grades. In June, when the protests first started, only 30 percent approved of the job he was doing in response to the protests. And in August, that is at 32 percent, so just barely changed. So so give me a sense as as we head into the fall campaign, what is the president's greatest asset? Is Is it this base that we hear so much about? I think the base is a very strong asset here in Wisconsin that um, Republicans are pretty strongly approving of the president. 89% of Republicans approve, 79% of independents who lean Republican approve. And that's that sort of steady high level of support that he's enjoyed throughout his term from his partisan supporters. And it actually runs a little bit higher than President Obama typically got from Democrats during his term, where Democrats tended to rate him in the high 70s, low 80s compared to Trump's high 80s and sometimes into the 90s. So that support is really quite helpful. Independents, on the other hand, are not pure independents who don't lean to either party is a little more problematic. There he's only averaged 39 percent approval. 47% disapproval. And of course, on the opposite end, Democrats have given him a 10% or less approval rating throughout his term. Um, If you look at kind of intensity across the parties, Democrats disapprove of him more than Republicans approve. And that's the other side of this, that the uh, re-election as a referendum on the president faces a 
united Democratic Party that's even more opposed to the president by a few percentage points, three or four percentage points, more opposed to the president, more disapproving of him than Republicans are approving. So the Republican base is strong. It's definitely a stronger group of supporters than he faced in mid-2016, for example. But Democrats are far more united against him this year than they than they were in 2016. So we've been talking about uh, President Trump and getting a sense of voter attitudes toward the president. Uh, how have voters felt about Joe Biden during the polling that we've done on him? Uh, voters have been pretty positive, and Democratic voters especially positive. In early 2019, when we first started looking at the presidential race, 81% of Democrats said that Biden was either a top choice or an acceptable choice for them. Only 13% said he was not acceptable. So that was a fairly strong base. We also found that he was a second choice of a lot of uh, voters who put somebody else in first choice but found Biden their second pick. Uh, that has helped sustain him. Throughout the primary season, in head-to-head -head matchups for uh, the who would you vote for in the primary, Biden led in six of the seven monthly surveys we did, trailing Bernie Sanders in February, uh, just before the South Carolina primary and Super Tuesday, which really boosted Biden into the presumptive nominee role. Yeah, that was a pretty remarkable change. I recall that back in February from Sanders to Biden in the span of a month. Um, does Joe Biden have the same strong base of support that Donald Trump has? In terms of voting, yes, Democrats are very strongly for Biden. Again, if we put together the last three polls of likely voters, 95% of Democrats are voting for Biden, 91% of Republicans voting for Trump. Both very united parties, but the smallest of advantages for Biden there by four points. If we look at independents who lean to a party, Biden gets 92% of independents leaning Democratic, while Trump only gets 81% of independents leading Republican. Uh, so the symmetry or near symmetry we see with full partisans is a little bit weaker and a little bit more of Biden's advantage when we go to independents who lean to a party. That's a group that Trump might increase his appeal to, or at least try to, to balance the scales a little bit. Finally, with independent, purely independent voters not leaning either way, uh, it's 36 for Biden, 38 percent for Trump over these last three polls, but 26 percent are not supporting either. Um, we've not asked about third party candidates yet, but we will when they are certified on the ballot uh, for the fall shortly. Uh, and you know, the, the question is, in 2016, we saw uh, an unusually high third party vote in Wisconsin, uh, uh, over about 6%, when normally we're at 1% or 2%. Uh, we don't yet know whether the folks that say, I don't want to vote for either of these candidates, or I don't know who I'm going to vote for, will those folks gravitate to a third party? Will they decide not to vote? Or will they decide in the end to make a choice between the two major party candidates? Yeah, I think I remember Gary Johnson, the Libertarian candidate, got 107,000 votes in Wisconsin. So you're right, that was a, a factor in, in what happened in this state. You know, Charles, we launched this poll back in 2012, uh, which was an interesting political year in the state of Wisconsin. Um, I want to talk to you about what's happened in the political landscape since then. And, and, and in terms of the way people of this state identify themselves politically. We've seen a little bit of change over the years. We have, and it's not gigantic, but it is important. And I think for folks that are not caught up in the Wisconsin landscape all the time, it's kind of important. You know, Wisconsin had been called part of the blue walls uh, for Democrats, uh, states that had voted Democratic since uh, 1984. Uh, but that missed how close recent elections have been, 19, or 20, 2000, 2004, and 2016 were all decided by less than one percentage point. So we've had recent 
close elections in the state. Therefore, the shift in partisanship that we see is also important. When we started polling in 2012, there was a small Democratic advantage, 32% Democratic to 28% Republican. But that has shifted so that in 2020, it's 30% Republican, 29% uh, Democratic, um, a very small sliver of a, of a Republican advantage. When you add in the people that lean to a party, we're at 45, 45, so as close as you can get. But that means that eight years ago, there may have been a slight Democratic advantage in partisanship in the state, and that's been erased. Where did the shift come from? It overwhelmingly came from white men without a college degree. Those working class white voters, as we talked about in 2016, that that supported Trump so much. In 2012, those folks were six points more Republican than Democratic. But now in 2020, they are 23 points more Republican. Uh, that accounts for most of the overall shift that we see in our totals data. Uh, white women without a college degree have shifted a little bit from a net three points Democratic to a net three points Republican, but nowhere near the size of the shift that we've seen um, with uh, white non-college men. Finally, the, the white men with a college degree have been leaning Republican. Uh, they were plus 10 Republican in 2012. They're plus eight now, so almost no change. And finally, the, the white college women have been very democratic to begin with. They were plus 13 in 2012, plus 16 now. So, and, and African-Americans and Hispanic voters have not moved much at all. Independent voters among African-Americans has grown just a little bit at the expense of the Democrats, but in both Latino and black voting groups, uh, Republicans still command only about 11% of the uh, uh, electorate of so, people of color. Sure. So, so let's talk about the, uh, the geographic uh, nature of Wisconsin. Are we seeing these changes play out in certain regions of the state more than others? We are seeing that, and we're seeing countervailing movement. Uh, if you look at how votes have shifted, or especially how the margin of the vote between the two parties has shifted since 2010, throughout the counties in the southeastern part of the state, uh, the part of the state below the line from Green Bay over to Iowa, almost every one of those counties has shown smaller Republican majorities now than they did in the same contest four years earlier. Um, now, that doesn't mean these counties are voting majority Democratic, but it means that their Republican majorities are smaller than they were, or their Democratic majorities have grown a bit. Uh, and so that's an important shift. At the same time, many, not all, but many of the counties north and northwest of that diagonal line have shifted in a more Republican direction. We saw that with Donald Trump's victory in which he dramatically increased the margin in those Northwestern counties compared to Mitt Romney in 2012. But we also saw it in Governor Walker's uh, failed reelection bid in 2018 in which he lost statewide, but increased his margin in most of those Northern and Northwestern counties. Uh, and so we are seeing the geography of the vote becoming a bit more favorable to Democrats in the Southeast and more favorable to Republicans in the Northwest. That's interesting. Much of that area that we talk about, the, the, the district has changed a little bit, but much of that area was represented by the Democrat, Dave Obey, for, for decades. And uh, that has now become kind of a Republican stronghold in this state. It really has from 1969 when Obi took that seat until he retired in 2010. It was a reliable Democratic seat for him, but the region was at least competitive, if not leaning Democratic in a lot of races, uh, and that shifted. The other thing that's going on geographically in the state is 
cities and large towns have been becoming more democratic, while the surrounding counties and countryside have either remained solidly Republican or even become more Republican. So in some of the counties, especially in the Fox Valley region, south and southwest of Green Bay, you're seeing much more competition in the three largest counties there, but that's largely driven by a greater polarization with the cities tilting Democratic and the countryside remaining very, very Republican. So a little purple there, but it's because you're blending a deep red and a deep blue, not because the counties themselves are evenly split. I want to spend a couple of moments, Charles, on on Madison and, and Dane County, the, the county in which Madison is located. Over the years, you and I have watched this county play an increasingly large role in election outcomes in Wisconsin. Talk to us for a few moments about why Dane County and Madison are so important at this moment in our history. It's a confluence of several things that we're seeing with with Dane County in particular. First, it's the fastest growing county in the state in population terms. Uh, It has steadily grown over the last decade, at least ahead of every other county in the state, including the more populous Milwaukee County or the collection of Milwaukee County suburbs. So it's getting bigger. Now, often population growth means newer voters coming in who are not participating as much. But the opposite is true in Dane County. Voter turnout as a percent of adults or as a percent of registered voters has continued to rise in the county. If you look at Dane County in comparison to the other 3,000 some odd counties in the country, Dane County ranks in the top 10 of 3,000 counties for turnout and has simply been getting higher, not plateauing. You think at some point there's going to be a limit to how high the turnout can go, how high the participation can be, but it has continued to grow. And then the last piece of the trifecta is the Democratic margins in the county, which has historically been famous for being a very Democratic bastion, have only continued to grow. So in one recent election, we saw nearly an 80 percentage point margin for the uh, Democrat or the liberal candidate in Madison. And it's uh, only a little bit below that for the county as a whole. Last thing about Dane County, unlike a lot of places, the suburbs in Dane County are almost as pro-democratic as the city of Madison. So whereas in the Milwaukee area, the suburbs are quite Republican, the city quite democratic, in Dane County, that's not true. Both the suburbs and the city are very democratic. Charles, no, go ahead. Did you have something else to to add there? It's just that the combination of all those things means that Dane County and Madison punch above their weight in statewide contests because they have high population, high turnout, and high democratic margins. And sometimes that means they put almost or even more net Democratic votes up against what the city of Milwaukee or Milwaukee County produces, despite the population difference. That mostly happens, though, in lower turnout races, not in presidential races. You know, you've, you've touched on this a couple of times. Uh, we've been talking about uh, demographic groups and, and how they're uh, how they seem to be uh, uh, prepared to vote in this election. But I, I do want to spend some time talking specifically about areas of strength for both. Uh, for Well, let's begin with the, the president. What are his key demographics that, that will help him greatly in this November election? So let's set aside the obvious ones, people who think of themselves as Republicans or independents who lean Republican or think of themselves as conservative or very conservative. It's certainly no surprise that all four of those groups are enormously uh, voting for, for President Trump. But when we go to the other groups, those white men without a college degree, once again, loom especially large. They're giving over the last three months, a 27 point edge to Trump, 60 to 33. Um, And after heavily voting for Trump in 2012 and proving their importance to his original election, they're critical for maintaining that coalition coming into the uh, 2016 contest. Um, The other groups, uh, one is small, but it's gotten a lot of talk and that's farmers. 
Uh, and here I'm including people who work on farms as well as uh, own the farms. So it's a little bit of a mixed group. This is a very Republican group, and it's voting for Trump 60 to 33, the same as these white non-college men. Uh, largely, this is in line with their partisanship. But with a lot of discussion we've had over the last three and a half years about tariffs and the impacts on the farm economy and exports, it's striking that he has solidly held support with farmers in the state, despite whatever economic difficulties they may have had, or maybe because they give him credit for helping them in a variety of ways. Nonetheless, 8% of the population can be kind of important in a race that's as close as we've often been. Finally, I'd mention born-again evangelical Christians. Uh, they make up about 17% of the state, but they're also very strongly for Trump, 60 to 34, so a big margin there as well. That's in keeping with other parts of the country, of course. One thing that's a little different in Wisconsin is we have a large Catholic population of 29% Catholic, who lean to Trump, but not nearly as much as the evangelical Protestants do. Um, and so that high Catholic population also competes with the born-again Christians and keeps the born-again population a little lower in Wisconsin than it might be in states that are more dominated by Protestant faith. And what are the, the key areas of demographic strength for Joe Biden? Well, again, setting aside liberals and Democrats, uh, black voters have to come in number one. Um, 80% for Biden, 10% for Trump, uh, about 10% undecided, and we'll see what happens with them and, and whether that evolves over the course of the campaign or not. That's uh, so a very large gap. Ha in Wisconsin, African-American voters are important for Democratic wins statewide. And the need for high turnout among African Americans is important, critically so in the city of Milwaukee, where uh, a big segment of the black population lives. However, having said that, black voters make up only about 4% of registered voters in the state. And so it is not uh, a large voting group, but when it delivers large margins like we're seeing right now, and high turnout, then it can be very important, again, especially in a really close race. Um, the opposite of the born-again Christians is the people with no religious connection, the religious nuns, as they're sometimes called. They're voting 66 to 22 for Biden, a 44-point uh, margin, a little bit bigger, actually, than the um, uh, margin among um, uh, Born again Christians. And this group makes up the same 17% of the population that evangelicals make up. Uh, so, a growing population segment and one that's very secular and very pro democratic. Finally, I think the biggest surprise is people who think of themselves as moderate politically are going strongly for Biden 51 to 28, a 33 point margin. Uh, when you look into this a little bit, you find that moderates do identify as Democrats in partisanship by a 20 point margin over Republicans. So they may be ideologically moderate, but they're certainly a democratic leaning group. However, the 20% partisan gap is a good deal lower than that 33 point voting gap. So it is clear that among moderates, there's something more than partisanship that's driving them either towards Biden or away from Trump. So, so each candidate, Charles, has key areas of strength. Uh, there are certain voters who are much more likely to vote for either Joe Biden or Donald Trump. But there's also this group of voters out there that I don't know how you would describe them. I'll let you do that. You're the pollster. But, but um, they are much closer on, on certain issues. And, and let's talk for a couple of moments about who those people are and what we're seeing. Yeah, in, in this highly politicized, highly polarized state, uh, it's easy to find groups that are highly split, like the ones we've just been talking about. 
But there are some that are not as polarized, and they may hold the key to what might swing from one election to the next. Um, the most important groups right there that I would emphasize are white non-college women and white college men. The men and women in these two groups are very polarized, uh, as we saw earlier. But these two groups, white non-college women and white college men, are much more evenly balanced. White men with a college degree are 47-46 for Trump, and non-college women are 47-42 for Biden. So both of these are very close, the women tilting a little for Biden, the men dead even. Uh, but in 2016, we saw the women, these non-college women, going for Trump, and we saw the men either even or tilting a little bit for Trump. However, in 2018, in the governor's race and in the Senate race, we saw both of these groups shifting to the Democrats who won both of those races in 2018. So naturally, a lot of attention focuses on the white non-college men and the white college women because they are the anchors of each side, the bases of each side. But these other two groups of, of whites with religion and, I mean, uh, with education and um, uh, gender, uh, really are more the pivotal groups and the ones that we might see change over the course of the campaign. And they're pretty evenly balanced there. The last thing is geographically, the suburban areas of the state are breaking pretty evenly if we think of the suburbs everywhere in the state. So that's the Milwaukee suburbs, the Madison suburbs, the Green Bay suburbs, and so on. If we look in the suburbs right around Milwaukee, and the so-called wow counties of Waukesha, Ozaukee, and Washington, there we see a Trump advantage. Uh, at the moment, it's not as large as his vote advantage in 2016. However, in 2016, our polling and others showed those counties voting less for Trump than they actually did in the end. And so how those suburbs ultimately shake out and vote is going to be something well worth watching through the rest of the fall. You referenced the uh, the gender gap in that answer, and and I want to spend a, a moment on that because it is, as it is nationally, it is enormous in the state of Wisconsin. If we ignore these things about race and ed and uh, education and just focus on gender alone, then among women, Biden leads fifty five to thirty six, a nineteen point Biden advantage, while men favor Trump 53 to 39, a 14 point advantage. Um, women are a slightly larger share of the voting population, about 53% of registered voters to 47% for men. So here's another way to see where Biden's moderate small lead that we've seen uh, is, is rooted. Um, now, the one thing that this masks is that over the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen an alignment or realignment as women have increasingly identified as Democrats and men increasingly as Republicans. And so when we look at it that way, women identify by a net of 15 points more Democratic than Republican. Men identify as more Republican by a 17 point margin. So you can see from those that the voting gap is only a little bit bigger than the partisan gap. And often when we look only at Democrats, we don't see much of a gender gap. If we look only at Republicans, not much of a gender gap. Gender gap is a little bigger among pure independents. Let's talk about a couple of issues that are front and center in our country right now and, and could certainly play and probably will play a role in this year's election. The first one is the coronavirus, Charles. How is that issue, the pandemic, how the pandemic has been handled, how is all of that playing with Wisconsin voters? Uh, it is uh, a central issue in terms of concern about the pandemic, which was, of course, sky high at the beginning of the spring in March. Uh, what we've seen is the, the people who feel very concerned about getting the disease themselves had been working its way down from March to May to June, 
But it ticked up by about eight points in August following rises in infections and death rates in the South and Southwest, rising cases here in Wisconsin, but at least so far, not much of a rise in the death rate here. Uh, but concern certainly moved up in the last month after trending down. President Trump's job approval has also trended. We mentioned earlier he was at 51% approve in March on a, handling the virus, 44% in May and in June, and now 40% in August. So he's had some slippage there. In contrast, as in other states, the governor gets higher ratings on handling the virus. Initially, 76% approved of his handling of the virus in March. That fell in May and June a bit to 58 in June, but now ticked up to 61% uh, this month. Uh, and that follows a statewide mask edict from the governor, uh, which is getting 69% approval ratings. And so in handling the virus, the governor gets substantially higher ratings uh, than the president does. The mass protests that this country has seen and that Wisconsin has seen uh, since the death of George Floyd has engendered a lot of debate. You see the Trump campaign trying to make this an issue about law and order, and the Biden campaign says this is about social justice. Uh, it, it is an important part of the, the campaign conversation as we head into the fall, Charles. How do the people of Wisconsin feel about some of the issues associated with those protests? This has the potential to be a little dynamic based on two months of polling about this now. Uh, excuse me, my phone's going off. Uh, <laughs> uh, always turn off the phone, they tell me, but I didn't do it this time. Uh, uh, so on the in June, 61 to 36 approved of the protests. Uh, in our August poll, though, that's fallen to an even split, 48-48. And white voters who were at about 59% approval in June uh, fell to 41-45 disapproval in August. So there has been some movement there. However, that hasn't redounded to the president's benefit. Again, I mentioned earlier, 30% approved of his response to the protests in June, only 32%, just a two-point rise in August. However, uh, voters are about evenly divided on the nature of the protests. 48% say it's been mostly peaceful, 41% saying they've been mostly violent. Um, there is still a plurality approval of the Black Lives Matter movement, but that also fell off by about 10 points from a substantial net favorable rating in June uh, to a still favorable, but not as strong a rating in uh, our August data. So their opinions do seem to be moving on this, but they don't seem to have affected views of the president. How, how about uh, quickly, Charles, about views of police? Uh, how, how are police faring in, in our polling? Wisconsin voters are especially positive towards the police, 72% uh, favorable to 18 unfavorable in June. That rose to 76% favorable, 13 unfavorable in August. Uh, so there's a lot of sympathy for the police. In our June data, we could see uh, folks who were critical of the police handling uh, of the George Floyd case uh, and who were sympathetic to the Black Lives Matter movement and the, and the uh, protests but who simultaneously strongly oppose defunding the police uh, and are, as, as these numbers have just shown, very sympathetic, very favorable to the police in general. There is a gigantic gap in the experience people have with the police based on their race. Uh, African Americans are as likely to feel anxious as they are to feel safe when they're around the police. Hispanic Americans about the same, very evenly divided, whereas white Wisconsin voters are 90% comfortable when they're around the police. And I think that difference in how different racial groups experience the police is a powerful anchor to white support for the police in the state, even if 
as there was in June and to a lesser degree in August, sympathy among whites for uh, the treatment of blacks and and some commitment to reform the police. We saw about 80 percent supported reform and greater accountability, even as barely 20 percent support defunding the police, just over 20 percent in June, about 17 percent in August. So there's a big gap here about how to reform the police and produce accountability, coupled with a lot of white sympathy for the police and comfort with them that is not shared by people of color. I think it's also interesting. To, it points out that words do matter. Defunding the police is pretty toxic to Wisconsin voters, whereas reforming police is more acceptable. So it, it is interesting how you, you present the uh, the discussion. Um, Charles, uh, we've talked about a couple of the big issues that, that are are uh, dominating much of the debate these days, but there are many other issues that voters will uh, take into consideration as they make their decision this fall. And in our last poll, we asked about a number of these issues. Can you give us an overview of, of some of the highlights of, of what we found in, in these other important issues in the campaign? Yeah, these are issues that absent the virus and absent an economic crisis and absent Black Lives Matter protests, I think we would have been focusing on in the campaign because these are issues that have been part, at least for the most part, part of the last four years as well. Uh, they've receded into the background in current circumstances, but they're still part of the issue divide. Some are deeply divided but by party. The largest percentage divides are actually uh, keeping schools and businesses open, even if COVID cases increase. Uh, that's a big dividing line. But more conventionally, a big divide on raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour and repealing the Affordable Care Act, uh, requiring masks in public places has a pretty big divide, though not as big as those others. And finally, enacting the Green New Deal has a big divide, but with an asterisk, because about a third of Wisconsin voters say they don't know what the Green New Deal is or have an opinion about it. Uh, that's a great example of where elites debate this and think they've seized on an issue either for them or against the other party. And yet, in fact, one out of three voters really don't have an opinion about it. There are four issues that we found out of 12 where majorities of both parties agree. Who knew that this was even possible in these days? Um, but the issues are sort of interesting. One is uh, that health insurance should be, plans should all be required to cover pre-existing conditions. That, of course, is part of the Affordable Care Act. 92% uh, support that. A path to citizenship of children brought here uh, as um, undocumented immigrants when they were young. Uh, again, a big 79% support a path to citizenship for them. 75% uh, support a 12-week paid ma uh, maternity leave for workers. Uh, and finally, opposition to defunding the police, 68% uh, oppose that, and both parties agree on that. So here you see some issues like a citizenship in DACA, where the parties in Congress and the president have been at loggerheads for years over, but there's actually bipartisan support. And things like pre-existing conditions which is part of a big divide on Obamacare, nevertheless has unanimity or near unanimity on uh, coverage of those pre-existing conditions. Let's wrap up with a question about voter enthusiasm and what that might look like this year. This one's easy, though. There's been a lot of national debate about it. In terms of commitment to voting in November, people saying they're absolutely certain they'll vote, there is no difference in our data between Democrats and Republicans. There's a big drop off in independence. And so that group, again, is worth paying attention to as we go ahead. Um, but if you ask how enthusiastic are you about voting in November, there's only a very small Democratic advantage in being very enthusiastic about voting. You've seen some national polling that ask how enthusiastic are you about voting for Donald Trump or voting for Joe Biden. And there, there are differences where Trump supporters say they're more enthusiastic to vote for him than Biden supporters do.
However, some polling has also asked the opposite question. How enthusiastic are you about voting against Donald Trump? And that looks more in line with our data that opposition to Trump is quite strong and those folks are very enthusiastic to vote against him. You put all of this together and you can see that the political divides that have dominated Wisconsin politics since at least 2010 are playing out in this year in Trump's reelection bid with strong bases on both sides, independents and some voting groups caught in the middle and capable of shifting a bit one way or another, and overlaid with all of that, a bit of remaking of partisanship in the state to at least some degree, and a remaking of the electoral map shifting in the southeast in one direction and the northwest in the other direction. That's a great summary. Uh, Charles, if, if people uh, still want to know more about this, what we just talked about, or any of the polling that we've done since 2012, where can they go? Uh, our website is law.marquette.edu slash poll, P-O-L-L, and that'll get you to the landing page that shows the press releases for each of our polls. But if you look towards the top, you'll see some drop-down menus. And the most important is results and data, which will show you every question we've ever asked and the results. And there are a couple at the top that go to interactive top lines, which will allow you to search all 1,200 questions we've ever asked and see the answers to them in every survey that we've asked about that question. There are also interactive cross tabs for the really nerdy folks. <laughs> yeah, of course, you're not one of those. My people. Uh, <laughs> your people, that's right. <laughs> well, uh, Charles, it's always a delight to talk with you. Thanks for walking us through the, uh, the uh, data and what we've learned about Wisconsin voters this year and in years past. It's always a, a pleasure to be with you. And uh, we appreciate everybody's interest in this. And we hope they uh, have an interesting convention wherever they may be. They may not be in Milwaukee, but they could be somewhere watching. So we'll be back again with more polling throughout the fall campaign. Charles Franklin, the director of the Marquette Law School poll. Thank you very much. And thanks to everybody who was watching today.